my internal monologue was like, this is a nightmare. <laughs> I am never going to do this again. I'm not going to stand up here and watch the glaze. And from then on, the rest of the year, it was like, how can I present this material in a different way? Welcome to another season of I Taught English Abroad, where we cover a range of topics from the world of TEFL. This podcast has it all, from passport stamps to recruitment, tips for teachers who want to be internet sensations, finding accommodation in far-flung locales, and so much more. Subscribe now so you don't miss any new episodes. You probably remember your favourite teacher. They were the one that gave you some creative freedom, that designed your favourite projects, the one that instilled faith in you and let you really be yourself. For many, that teacher will have been our next guest, Betsy Potash. American, but now based in Budapest, Betsy's approach to teaching is utterly, unstoppably creative, and she's given a generation of teachers amazing ideas through her website and podcast, Now Spark Creativity. We got an hour or so to speak to Betsy, and really, it could have been so much longer. Here's Betsy's story. I'm here with Betsy Potash. Now, Betsy, it's such an honour getting you on this podcast uh, as we'll explore what you provide for teachers and the work that you've done is absolutely incredible um, and there's an absolute wealth of resources that we're going to direct you to towards the end. But first of all, how are you? How are you doing? Ah, I'm great. It's a beautiful day here in Bratislava and I'm happy to be here. So plenty of our audience will already know who you are, but for the uninitiated, shall we say, can you tell us a little bit about where you're from and and how you got into the the teaching world? Yeah, of course. So I'm originally from Minnesota. I'm a lake girl by birth, and I moved out to California for college, fell in love with that area, and that's where I decided to become a teacher. I was studying English and loving it, and I was learning so much from the way my professors were teaching as well as the actual work itself. And so when I became a senior, I did an internship at a boarding school that was near my college. And it was kind of a crazy time because I was in three English classes. And then I was sort of assistant teaching three English classes. And so I had, I was sort of reading six books at a time and trying to keep up with it all and and think about it from a student's perspective and a teacher's perspective. And It was like a really influential time for me. I realized that was really what I wanted to do. It was perfect for me. And so I I actually took a job at that same boarding school when I graduated. Excellent. So so tell me about that boarding school environment. What's it like to teach there compared to, you know, either working freelance or working in a school with sort of regular hours? What's 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 the difference? Yeah, that's a good question. I I loved it because it allowed me to bring in so many different parts of myself. I was able to be a teacher. I was a tennis coach and I'm I come from a big tennis background, so I enjoyed having that aspect in my life as well. And then I had advisees that I would have over to like make cookies and have dinner and hang out. And I would take kids on snorkeling trips and go on hikes with them on the weekends and be with them in the dorm. It was a very intense (laughs) period of my life as a teacher. You know, I would really often work 14 or 16 hour days when I first started out in teaching. And at the end of that first year, I definitely had to be like, okay, if I'm going to continue to do this, I'm going to have to have a few more boundaries. But I did just learn a ton in that first year about who I wanted to be as an educator, how to bring in all different parts of my personality and all, all my different gifts, which was really a blessing. We'll talk about your personality and, and, and your gifts as well, because there's so much to mine here. I just I find your career so, so impressive. So you're the creator behind uh, Now Spark Creativity, and we're going to cover creativity in the classroom and, and obviously your work in, in great detail. But first, I, I wanted to ask, when in your teaching journey did you realize there was so much scope for teachers and students to be creative in the classroom? Well, I love that question because it reminds me of a story that was kind of like the pivotal moment in my teaching career. And it's funny because it was my first day of school. Right, okay. <laughs> so it was a long time ago. It was the very first day. I had I was up, you know, half the night, like so many new teachers just planning what was I going to do? What was I going to wear? How was I going to feel? And I was so nervous. And the main advice I got from people was to go over the syllabus. And so 
had my syllabus ready in my hands. You know, I got up there at the front and I'm reading my syllabus out loud to my students. And you can just see the glaze (laughs) falling over their eyes, right? They do not want to listen to me read the (laughs) syllabus. They are not interested. They're like covertly looking at the clock thinking, who is this new teacher? And it was, it was then that I realized I could be having like one (laughs) internal monologue while I was saying something completely different. And my internal monologue was like, this is a nightmare. (laughs) I am never going to do this again. I'm not going to stand up here and watch the glaze. And from then on, the rest of the year, it was like, how can I present this material in a different way? How can I have them learn this through a project? What kind of discussion method puts the focus on them? Because I'm not doing that glaze thing ever again. Absolutely. And in your view, how, how important is it, you know, with, the, with that in mind and obviously trying to avoid the glaze, which I'm sure is going to be the catchphrase for the rest of the episode now, but <laughs> how, how important would you say it is for learners to engage with critical and creative thinking as part of their learning process? And, and, I, and I, mean, I mean that from like the earliest stages up to, you know, higher education. What what impetus would you would you put on that? I mean, for me, you can probably guess coming from <laughs> what I do, it's it's. <laughs> so important. It's it's the most important for me. It was the most important for me as a student. When I look back at my life as a student, the only things I remember are the creative projects that were meaningful to me. In high school, I remember my National History Day project. I remember the morality plays festival that I did in 11th grade. I remember, you know, the mock trial for Flaubert about his novel Madame Bovary that I did senior year. And in college, it's the same. I remember putting on a Midsummer Night's Dream for my Shakespeare class and participating in the Senate, the mock Senate in, that that encompassed multiple colleges. Those were the moments when I learned things. I, ca- I cared, right? I really wanted to do well in these projects. I did tons of extra work on my own. They really impacted me. And as a teacher, I'm looking to create that kind of experience for my students. How can I make the learning feel like it's going to be relevant to their future life? How can I make them feel like they're creating something that means something? It's not just for me. It's for their community or it's for their peers or it's because they're really passionate about the subject. That is always what I'm looking to do. And I find that the skills of English and language, writing, speaking – really lend themselves to that. It's not necessarily about specific content. It's about how you are engaging with that content, how you're creating based on that content. And that's what I, that's what I love to do is create experiences where students can, can have that memorable moment like I did back when I was a student. And, you know, a lot of your work is about, again, we're going to cover this in more detail as we, as we go on, but a lot of your work is about using kind of games and, and less traditional methods, podcasts as well, that, and that comes up later on. But that's all to keep classes engaged and creative. And like you say, I, I, I was just thinking, as, as, as you told me that, a lot of memories I have of school are of creative projects. So you're definitely right there. But has there ever been a time in your teaching career when you've kind of, that's, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say you've faced opposition as such, but have you been asked to stick to a rigid curriculum and, and risk the, you know, the glaze as you call it, or have you always been encouraged in, have employers always kind of known who you are and known the teaching approach that you have, or has there ever been that, that kind of tension and then that kind of, you know, pull and release if you like? Yeah. Yeah. I definitely think there's been that kind of tension in my life. I have never been asked to to stick to a really rigid curriculum. So I've had the benefit to be working in different schools that thought teachers should have the right, the the honor <laughs> to create curriculum that they believe their students would engage with. So I, I often have received book lists, you know, this is the general curriculum for 10th grade, but it's never like a day by day kind of thing. And so I've had a lot of freedom. What I have certainly run into is people sort of you know, pinching their nose at some creative methods or saying like, oh, is that really that rigorous? Um, That is something that I've definitely encountered in my career. And it's frustrating. And it's honestly one of the reasons why I've created the communities that I have online. 10 years ago, I created Creative High School English as a Facebook community. And I thought, oh, there, there have got to be some other teachers like me who just want a supportive space to talk about their creative ideas because maybe they're not supported by some of their colleagues. And now there are 26,000 teachers in it. And so I know I'm not alone, right? I might 
I might be at one school where I'm alone, but I'm not alone in the world. And, and I can see what an impact this type of project and learning has on my students. And so when somebody says to me like, oh, is that really rigorous? It seems like a lot of your students are doing pretty well. It must not be hard enough. Then I can say, you know what? They just had their work published with National Public Radio. And we just took, we just did like a live radio show in the student comments and they loved it. And they're so engaged. Like you may not think that it's rigorous by, by some kind of, you know, artificial standard, but I know how they're learning. Mm-hmm. And that actually, that, that brings me to a point, and I'm really sorry to put you on, on a spot like this, but it, it's, <laughs> it makes me think of something in particular, because we're going to have teachers or pers- prospective teachers, English teachers, who are listening to this and thinking, okay, great, so I've got my own ideas in terms of how I want to teach a certain grammar rule or a certain punctuation rule, something. But they're going to face, you know, that kind of inquiry. People going like, oh, is this rigorous enough? Is this, is it, is the approach that you're using, is it enough for, for my child? How how do you deal and what advice would you give when you have to have those conversations about, you know, you know, my method is working and this is justifiable. And yes, you know, you're asking me to justify it to you, but I can completely explain this, the, t- the students love it. How do you n- navigate those conversations? Because it must feel a little bit confrontational maybe at times, or it must feel like a bit of a kind of stress where, you know, someone's asking you to kind of explain yourself. Is Does that come up? And, and how do teachers, you know, what's the best way to deal with that? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think, I think it's very helpful to have some background in different creative methods. So like if you're, if you're, for example, going to get your students started podcasting, I know that was something that you mentioned, you, you might want to know a little bit about the industry. You might want to know that there are millions of downloads of podcasts. You might want to know that ESPN and NPR and the New York Times have all these podcasts. You might want to know all the different types of jobs that students might go into related to podcasts. And so when you say to you know, your colleague or a student's parent, hey, we're going to do a podcasting project where the students create 60-second podcasts showing off their knowledge of this grammar rule, you can say, we're learning the grammar rule. <laughs> they're learning the grammar rule, and then they're engaging in this medium that is really real and relevant in the world, and other classes are going to listen to their podcast to help them learn, and the students are going to feel like they're creating a type of content that is legitimate in the world. It's not just like, okay, I got three points for writing a sentence using this grammar rule. It's like, no, I learned how to record audio. I learned how to mix the audio. I created a product that other students can now learn from. Maybe my class is going to put up a podcast channel on Anchor called like Learn the Grammar Rules and 60 seconds, you know, and help other kids who are learning English all over the world. There's, you know, I I could go on and on for like so many different types of creative techniques that you might try in class, but, but, you know, you want to have some basis for what you're doing. (laughs) You want to do some reading or listen to some podcasts yourself to give you a sense of, of why you're going to do the thing that you're going to do, but also you're just going to have great ideas and, and you might have to go looking a little bit for how you might defend that idea. Look at, you know, project-based learning, look at how, um, creativity and critical thinking are valued in the workplace today over rote learning, rote understanding. Excellent. And and this is amazing stuff. And I think a lot of teachers are going to be listening to this and, and, and realizing the potential of what they can do and how it actually has like practical outcomes and, you know, job outcomes later along, um, as you kind of pointed to there. Now, you're based in Bratislava. Um, and while I really do want to get into the nitty gritty of kind of what you do as a teacher and what you've done as a teacher, obviously, given the title of the podcast, I uh, have to know a bit more about you, how, how long you've been uh, teaching abroad, where, where teaching has taken you. So I, I know, again, putting you on the spot, but, um, you know, where has this, where has this career taken you around the world? Yeah. Okay. So I started out teaching in California and I met my husband and we got married and we decided that we would kind of take teaching abroad as a honeymoon. (laughs) So that summer after we got married, we moved to England and I was working on my master's degree through the Breadloaf School of English. So I had a summer of study there at Oxford and he actually was getting a certification to teach English. And then we moved to Sofia in Bulgaria and we worked at a private American school there for students who were predominantly from Bulgaria. Um, So he was teaching eighth graders 
ESL and they had like a very serious ESL year because many of them didn't speak English, any English coming in as eighth graders. And then the school went on to ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th. And I taught 10th graders and 12th graders. So I was teaching kids who had just become really proficient in English, but I wasn't teaching ESL. I was teaching plays and books and poetry. Um, and we had, you know, we had a very up and down time <laughs> in our life in Sofia. We, we were there at a time when it wasn't too far after the collapse of communism. Um, course, there was yeah. corruption. We, you know, we'd get passed by black BMWs. We'd we get pulled over by the police just for being international. But we also loved things about it. We loved our students. We loved traveling around the country, hiking in the mountains, the food. Um, and we loved traveling around Europe. I think we went to like 20 different countries during the two years that we lived in Bulgaria. So anytime there was a break, we were like off to Italy or Prague or France. And that was an incredible joy. We learned so much about the world. But after two years, we were ready to go back home, have children. That's what we did. We returned. We had our two children. And then as soon as they were old enough where we felt like they were ready to travel with us and, and really remember it, then we started looking abroad again, this time only for my husband because I now work online with teachers. And so we found this job in Bratislava at a really interesting startup innovative high school and my husband came for a job here as the assistant head and I can work anywhere now so I work at coffee shops in Bratislava amazing amazing um, we're gonna hear all about Betsy Patash's approaches to different parts of education the innovative ideas that she's bringing to the classroom there's so much more coming in this episode so stay tuned feeling inspired fancy trying something completely new will make your best move yet by signing up for a TEFL course with the most highly accredited provider on the planet. Here at the TEFL Org, we offer a range of online and classroom courses that you can study at your own pace. All of our courses include top-of-the-range teaching materials and come with dedicated tutor support from experienced and highly qualified TEFL experts. And what's more, we'll give you money off to do it. Just enter the code PODCAST at checkout to get 50% off any of our internationally recognised TEFL courses. And that includes our best-selling 120-hour Premier Online course. With that code, you'll not only get 50% off, but you'll also get a free lesson plans pack. Within a matter of months, you could be a qualified TEFL teacher, out there exploring the world, or working to your own schedule from home as an online English teacher. Just use the code PODCAST at checkout to get started. And we're back with Betsy Patash. Now, in terms of socialization and building connections in the class, which is something that's, you know, it's fundamental for, for, for TEFL teachers, ESL teachers, for any teachers, really. You know, how important would you say creative tasks are? Because it seems like a great way to build cohesion and socialization, especially with, you know, uh, with students who are maybe a wee bit quieter or a bit more, you know, reticent to kind of come out their shell a little how how important are these creative tasks? Yeah, that's a good question. I think the class gets a chance to bond in a way that is unique when they're working on a project that takes everybody. So maybe our class is going to put on a short play and they're going to invite some other students to come and watch the play. Suddenly, everybody has an important job. Maybe one student who is never said anything, is an incredible painter, and they paint the backdrop. And another student, it turns out, is like really great with music, and they mix they mix the intro music. Somebody else is good at tech, you know, a couple people write the script. Like everybody comes together, and they start to see each other in a different way. And I find that that's true in small group creative projects, in large group creative projects, and also in individual creative projects. You put something out there for every student to do, and one student comes in with this just unbelievable, like blow you away project. And some, suddenly everybody else in the class is like, whoa, did you know that Aaron could do slam poems like that? Like I didn't, he has never <laughs> said anything before. And it just, 
it changes. It changes the way you see each other. You, as a teacher and students, you, I think, become closer. Um, the students themselves become closer in community, and it's just very powerful. Absolutely. Now, one of your, I, and again, I have scoured your website, and I could have, put, I could have come up with. <laughs> 300 questions for today so I'm just really I'm trying to trim to the the (laughs) best of if you like but one of your particular focuses is on podcasts now in my role as a content writer for the TEFL org I've talked about how film and tv even music can be used in the classroom um analyzing you know dialogue uh, analyzing accents lyrics even how how poetry comes together that kind of thing but never podcasts, um, which is a bit ironic given that I host one. Um, but <laughs> I, I'm interested to know how, in your view, podcasts can stimulate learning. Yeah, great question. Well, I think that there are a lot of different ways and a lot of different sort of intro moments you could have with your class with podcasts. One option with podcasts is simply to use them to present information that you want to present. In in the English language learning world, um, there's there's quite a lovely podcast that I like called Grammar Girl. And Grammar Girl, this host, has done incredible amounts of research and thought around all these super basic grammar rules and language things that tend to confuse people. And so there are, there are hundreds of episodes you could play that are super short that explain some crucial thing <laughs> that students need to know. And so there you have like a witty example, fun music, you know, and and it's like a mini lesson that you can just play for your students. So there are lots of podcasts like that on different topics that you might want to teach you around. Um Another way that you can use podcasts in the classroom is to practice listening skills and practice sort of my favorite way of having students take notes when they're listening to a podcast is with sketch noting. And so instead of just sort of writing down the information word for word, they're sort of trying to come up with what are the big ideas here? How can I connect them? What What's the heading here? What are some of the notes? But then also, could I draw a little part of this podcast? Could I like create some icons? Sketch notes is a whole thing that I, we could probably spend a whole podcast on. But if you find an incredible story um, on a podcast and you want to have students practice listening and processing and thinking about that podcast. You can have them sketch note as they listen, and then you can you can lead with it into some sort of conversation between partners, a group work task, maybe an, a piece of argument writing. There's one wonderful podcast that I love called Smash Boom Best that's for um, debate. And they'll take on all these different funny topics. My favorite episode is called Showers Versus Bath. And they have these two people argue extremely passionately for why showers crush baths. They're so much better and why why showers are the worst and baths are the best. And so you listen to them make these arguments and they're super funny and they have all these great examples. And then you can turn it over to students, like write your 60 second opinion that you're going to read out loud or, or discuss it with a partner. What do you think is better? showers or baths. Just like all these different ways that you can incorporate it into the skills that you want to be teaching. Um, And it's just like another fun genre. And it's a really relevant genre because podcasting is growing so fast. Um, And so it gives students that awareness of a whole genre that they might not know. And then really quick, you know, the last option, once you've started to build in some podcast listening, is to have students themselves podcast. And this is one of my favorite types of projects. It doesn't have to be complicated. There's a free audio recording tool on Chrome called Vocaroo, where students literally just put their mouse on a big red button and it records whatever they say. And at the end it says, do you want to download it? And you say, download. <laughs> and that's that. it can be that simple. They don't have to be an audacity or garage band when they're just starting out. They can just record a short podcast and it could be about anything. That's I mean, two things come up for me there. Um, the first being, you know, you talk, you talk about how uh, you talk about the podcast that brings up a sort of um, a debate within a class and, and students can listen to that, make their own uh, judgments how, how I mean how useful is debate as a form of creative classroom learning and and secondly I found when I was learning languages myself in, in school if we were able to tie things to our own experiences and our own opinions it was often a lot easier to actually remember and it sounds very self-absorbed I know but 
as it was often kind of easier to attach words and phrases to things around opinions I had. So, for example, if I'm doing German and I'm talking about uh, soccer or something like that, if, I found it easier to to remember. Is there something in that, and is is, is that something that you, as a creative, um, as a as a creative teacher, as someone who's worked with creative um, exercises your whole kind of teaching career, is that something that you would agree with? Yeah, I mean, I think when you're focused on a subject that you care about, that you're passionate about, it's going to make a huge impact on your learning. I think there are so many ways to build in students' interests into your class from like what examples you use, whether you use examples of grammar that are about pop culture that students are interested in, or if you use grammar that examples that are just like from a text. I I think of those, what are those super old books where kids would learn to read with texts like Dick and Jane look for the dog? Like, yeah. <laughs> are people going to be more interested to learn to read about that? Or like, I think of my daughter, she wants to read books about lost puppies who are rescued by little girls. And then the little girls get to adopt wow. them <laughs> because that is the story she wants for her life. Right. And so you know, that's true as we age at, at all ages. We want to read, we want to learn, we want to create around things that we actually care about. Absolutely. And and just before we get into another break, because again, I'm, I'm fascinated by this, but I get this very distinct impression of you as as someone who's been a teacher and, and your online presence as well, which we're going to get to in the next section. That, that's a big part of that. But for people listening who want to get into teaching or are, are in teaching but haven't quite carved themselves, like their teaching personality hasn't really emerged yet, how important is having and displaying your own personality as a teacher? Well, this is an interesting question because I feel like it, it can put pressure on people to feel like they have to have some kind of teaching persona. You know, I don't think you have to be larger than life to be a good teacher. I think some people have a huge personality and they're really extroverted and they want to be in the hall giving everybody high fives and doing like TikTok dances with the students. And that's great. If that's you, that's great. I'm not like that. <laughs> I'm pretty introverted. That's one of the reasons why I probably didn't want to stand in front of my class all the time. Um, I think what it's about is honoring who you really are and not feeling like you have to be some certain thing to be a good teacher. There are a million and one different styles of being a good teacher and different kids are going to connect with something different. You know, so a student who who is drawn toward a colleague who is out in the hall doing the TikTok dances may not fit as well with a teacher who's a little more introverted and focused on creative methods. But as long as every student can find a teacher that they connect with and relate to, that's really powerful. And so it's about leaning into who you are and what you what you value, what you bring to the table. And, and that takes a little time to figure out. But the first step is just to think like, I don't have to be Will Keating from yeah. Dead Poet Society. I don't have to be like some certain thing to be a good teacher. Brilliant. I, I, that's the perfect answer, genuinely. And it's not to discredit Dead Poet Society, but I, I you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I watched it five times. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, great. I will be right back in a couple of minutes to talk even more about Betsy's teaching career. Are you looking for a weekly guide to what's going on in the TEFL world? Do you want some advice on everything from job interviews to underrated TEFL destinations? Well, the TEFL Org blog has it all. Every single week, we tackle some of the biggest questions in the TEFL industry. Stay up to date with the latest trends in English teaching, find tips to make your next job application your best yet, or get inspired and read about the experiences of TEFL Org graduates teaching all around the world. Whether you're brand new to the industry or you've seen it all, we can guarantee an interesting read each week. To find out more, go to tefl.org forward slash blog. That's T-E-F-L dot O-R-G forward slash blog. And we're back with Betsy Potash. Now, can you please tell me about how your website, your general online presence came together? Because, you know, what's there now is so detailed and there's so much, you know, there's so many amazing resources on there. How did you come to the point of, you know, creating all that material and creating that online presence? When did, when did that sort of happen for you? Yeah, that's a fun question. So I was teaching for almost 10 years and 
I loved it. I, I particularly loved the curriculum design aspects of it and the building of different types of programs. And so that was in the back of my mind, you know, coming into a ways into my career. And then also um, I, I, I was a little frustrated by how the system didn't embrace creative teaching, even though I could see how powerful it was, even though I had so many stories of the impact in my own classroom, even though I had the research and I had read the books and stuff, and I just still wasn't feeling super supported in some of the contexts where I was working. And I, I didn't want that for other people who were in my same situation. So all this was sort of brewing in the back of my mind when I went on maternity leave and I had my first child. And he was still a tiny baby when one night, and bear with me, this seems like a crazy story, but one night I woke up in the middle of the night just like in terrible pain. And I had just had a baby. You'd think that's like one of the more painful experiences. But this, if anything, was worse. And I went to the emergency room and I had a kidney stone. I had gotten dehydrated with my little baby. And I was a wreck. I had to take like really strong pain medicine and just lay in bed for a while. (laughs) And while I was in bed, I got an email from my mom and had a link to a New York Times article about somebody who had left the classroom and was working to support teachers online. And she was writing curriculum and she was blogging. And keep in mind, this was a while ago. (laughs) So it seemed like a crazy thing to me. What? You could just design curriculum and help teachers? That's so interesting. And I'm just laying there thinking about this and I have nothing else to do because I can't get out of bed. And, and I just kind of decided that's what I want to do. Um, and so a few months later when I had my meeting to return to work, I, I really wasn't sure until I got to the meeting and my, (laughs) my admin that I was meeting with was like, look, we have two contract options for you, part-time, full-time, depending on how you want to return. And I was like, that's so nice, but actually I'm quitting. Um, and I started to do what I do now. I started to work on my blog. After a while, I started the podcast. I was designing curriculum. um, And I just love, love supporting teachers and their creativity. I am astonished by that because there's no way in a million years I would have expected that answer to involve having a kidney stone. I... (laughs) I, that is, I, I know. We might have to take a <laughs> might have to take a break from recording for about ten minutes just while I compose myself. That's incredible stuff. So, I mean, wow. But you, when did you start kind of seeing results from from the work that you were doing online? For example, like when were the first like few kind of reviews from teachers coming in and um, you know people saying, "Oh, these teaching materials are are fantastic. These approaches are are excellent." When did you first kind of start seeing results from that? Because there had to have been some early kind of successes that that got you to this point. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. I feel like the transition that I made from teaching into kind of like being a being a writer, being a social media person, <laughs> being a podcaster, it really influenced the way I see teaching English too because now I'm out in the world using English for my job. Whereas before I was teaching English. So I'm I'm using my English skills to teach teachers how to teach English schools. It's very skills. <laughs> it's very meta. And so at first when I was when I was making my transition into this job, I I didn't exactly know how to use all those skills in this job yet. And so I had very little result. (laughs) Very few people happened to find my blog. Very few people happened to follow me on Instagram, right? I had to learn how to be in a different career. And I had to take some classes and I had to listen to eight million different podcasts. And I had to watch YouTube videos to learn how to set up my microphone and what to buy. And, you know, I really, it was like a DIY career change. Um, but then little by little, it started to work. I I figured out how to write a blog post and, and share it. I figured out how to start a Facebook group. I figured out, you know, how to release a podcast to Apple and get a little bit of traction. And, and then I rinsed and repeated for a decade. <laughs> um, and, and the curriculum that I was writing and the strategies that I was suggesting continued to change because... I took the approaches that I had when I was in the classroom, but I also mixed and married them with what I was seeing in my 
career, like a second career. Um, so I could teach things like podcasting as a podcaster. <laughs> Great. So uh, there's, there's something that kind of comes up there. You know, you're, you're teaching and the teach materials that you do that you come up with now, uh, so much of it is about creativity and that will mean that students have more kind of space and freedom to make mistakes, you know, trial and error, that kind of thing, as long as there's like a positive kind of learning outcome. How much of a, of a break did you give yourself while you were figuring this all out? Because a lot of it, as you say, had to be kind of learning as 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 you go. Were, were there moments when you were a bit frustrated with, with any sort of lack of progress or having to sort of learn things? Or was it a case of, well, if someone else was teaching me this, they would give me the, lo- the, the long leash to, you know, learn these things for myself? What, what was that process like? And, and were you able to kind of give yourself mentally a, enough of a break to, to to make it successful? That is such an interesting question. I can look back on the last 10 years and pinpoint five or six times of like crisis <laughs> where, I, where I sort of bridged to a different level or something happened in the world that really changed what one aspect of what I was doing and I had to respond to it. And I didn't know what to do, you know, or it just felt like this life altering disaster for a few days. And, and the more often that has happened to me, (laughs) the more perspective I'm able to get. If you, if you talk to my husband, you would know it still rattles me. (laughs) I definitely still feel very (laughs) upset when some terrible thing happens in my work, but, but I do know I'll get out the other side. And so you know, I think I think in particular of a of a moment when I was working with my Facebook community and there were some teachers who were saying some horrible things in there and I was like how am I going to safeguard this community and make it a place where teachers can be creative and and share their ideas the way I want them to without sitting here at my computer 24-7 to monitor what people are saying. It's really hard. And I had come in from swimming with my kids in my cabin, like on summer vacation, to just this vitriol in my Facebook group. And then all these DMs and instant messages on Instagram saying like, do you know about the dumpster fire in your Facebook group? You know, and I was like, oh my God, like what do I do? Um, and it it took me days to figure out like, okay, I'm going to work with a team of moderators. I need to talk to these moderators. I need to, I need to make a plan with them. We need to figure out what their system is going to be. I'm going to create new community guidelines. I'm going to create like a welcome post that introduces every single new member to to what we value and who belongs here. I'm going to I'm going to hire somebody who's going to check every member of the group to make sure that they're a real person and not a bot or like a you know a person who's just trying to mess with us. And and all those steps took time and eventually they all went into place and now the group is just the loveliest place to be, you know, but but I can still vividly remember that moment like sitting at my dining room table with my towel around myself being like, "Oh my god, <laughs> what am I going to do?" Um and it's it's all a process like that and I I can I can honestly say to students as they learn new things, like it doesn't always go perfectly. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, I, I, it's just it's an important point because you know on on this podcast, it's all we we try and encourage teachers to do as as you know as much as they can in terms of creativity, in terms of you know this kind of get up and go spirit. But there's there's something really important there because you know that's all fine and well saying that, but what happens when it starts to grow and when things happen that you might not be expecting that kind of thing. But we'll go from vitriol to the complete opposite. Now you have as as we've already said you've got an enormous following a really enthusiastic following across your website and I was looking through Instagram comments and that kind of thing and, and the real warmth from your community to you is, is, is a sight to behold I would recommend that anyone you know listening to this does go and check out your Instagram but how, how often do people get in touch with you and tell you I tried this um these teaching materials I tried this lesson plan I tried this exercise whether it's the hexagonal learning or it's podcast related or you know, whatever it is, how often do people get in touch with you and say, this really worked for me? And does that make it all worth it? Yes. <laughs> people people do do that a lot. And every single time, it's incredibly meaningful to me. When I get emails that show me like a display somebody put up in their classroom of some materials that I designed and like how they're using that with their students, I absolutely love it. When I get a, a DM on Instagram that says somebody listened to the Spark Creativity Teacher podcast and they got an idea, you know, and now they're listening on their commute to work. And, you know, 
that kind of thing is fantastic. It really lights me up. I spend a lot of time every day talking with my teachers that I work with in my Facebook communities and on Instagram. And so I've, I feel like I know <laughs> them, you know, I, I, I know a lot of what people are going through. I know the challenges and I really want to help. And so if I hear that I did help, of course, that's very meaningful to me. So, Betsy, there's, there's something, obviously, you know, the impact that you have on students and the impact that your teaching materials have on students, it, it speaks for itself at this point. Uh, and, you know, there's a litany of resources that, that people can, can, can find and we'll direct, you know, we'll direct every listener to it at the end. But in terms of, you know, as a teacher, how, how important is it to come up with ideas and creative tasks? Because even in the most, you know, even the most enthusiastic teachers, the most enthusiastic of anyone in a vacation will have days where maybe they feel a little bit jaded, a little bit uninspired, and there are so many kind of variables going on. But how important is it to come up with your own ideas and your own, uh, you know, we talked earlier about personality, about kind of injecting your own ideas and personality in, into, sorry, I've made this a super long question. We'll go, we'll go again one sec. Sorry. God, that was practically war and peace. I apologize. Uh, right. Sorry. Um, okay. So, Betsy, there's something I want to ask you from the teaching side of it, because we will direct everyone to the litany of teaching materials that you've that you've provided and, and your blog and your website and your podcast. We will direct people there. But I'm just wondering, you know, how important in a career like teaching um, is it to keep coming up with your own approaches and ideas, if, if anything, to kind of stave off, you know, any sort of jaded kind of feelings that you might get along the way, because even the most, the best intention of teachers are going to occasionally have like peaks and valleys in, in their, in their career in terms of enthusiasm. How important would you say coming up with your own stuff is in terms of staving that off? When I look back at my career, I think about different times where I encountered a problem and that problem led me to come up with some new approach that then influenced my teaching forever after. And so sort of those approaches, those strategies build up to become your toolkit. And so I think of like my first year, I could not really figure out how to have students have a good discussion, right? I didn't want to ping pong back and forth with them. I say one thing, they say one thing. I say one thing, somebody else says something. I'm cold calling people. And so I learned about this method called the Harkness method, which was a student-focused form of discussion. And I was like, this is cool. I'm just going to try this. I'm going to try this in every class for a month. And if it's a disaster, then at the end of the month, I'm going to scrap it. But like, we're just going to try. It. And so I rolled it out as an experiment and it was so impactful. I love the method. At the end of the year, I went to a teaching conference just about that method and I spent five days learning about it and I met my husband there you go. <laughs> at the conference. And for the rest of my you know, teaching career, I used that method almost exclusively in whole class discussions because it was so powerful. And if I hadn't had those kind of bad discussions and been like, this is the worst, how can I fix this? What what strategy could I use? And then learned about some possibilities, then I would never have stumbled upon it, you know? And it's not like I invented it. The Harkness method goes back to Phillips Exeter Academy years and years ago. And I learned about it from experts and I learned about it from reading online, but I rolled it out in my own way. And over the course of you know, eight, nine years using it in 50 different classes, I, I really became an expert in it. And it became one of the core parts of my teaching. Um, and so I think for anybody teaching, they're going to have those moments. Their students are going to hate poetry. And so they're going to be like, oh, my students hate poetry. Hmm. I'm going to go to Pinterest. <laughs> I'm going to go to Instagram. I'm going to buy a book on poetry from AP. I'm going to go in my Facebook group of English teachers and say like, what do your students love in poetry? Because mine hate poetry. And I'm going to get a hundred different ideas, you know, then I'm going to do blackout poetry and I'm going to do performance poetry and I'm going to try I am from poems and I'm going to do a poetry bracket during March Madness. And like, then all of a sudden you have this amazing toolkit of poetry all because your students hated poetry one year and you were forced <laughs> to come up with something new. And so I think it's all about sort of staying open 
teach the things that are your jam, like your your bread and butter that you've loved for years. But then also some new student comes in and rocks the boat or you have a class that like won't talk. <laughs> and that's when you come up with something new. And then that new thing informs your career for the rest of your life. That's an amazing point, actually. I've got I've got to ask, do, do you find that or from from your experience anyway, did you find that your best stuff creatively came from when you were trying to problem solve as opposed to kind of just uh, I don't want to use corporate speak but you know as opposed to like blue sky thinking where you're planning out maybe an entire year's worth of classes did you did you find that your, your your best ideas came from adversity trying to overcome a problem I think I think when I was in the classroom, that was probably true. I I can remember this one night where I had decided I was going to roll out a poetry slam the next day, and I was just going to learn everything okay. I needed to know to do a poetry slam that week that night. And so, you know, I was looking everywhere for videos. I was pre-watching all these amazing performance piece clips and trying to find ones that didn't have swear words. And I was just looking and looking and looking, and it was like one in the morning, and I was like, I need to have have five. I have five examples. <laughs> but eventually I got five examples, you know, and, and then I did a poetry slam that year and the next year and the next year and the next year. And it became like one of the crowns of the year. And it all came from that insane night of trying to figure out how to roll it out. That's so cool. I, just before we finish up, and, and it's going to be a shame actually finishing this recording because I really have enjoyed myself. And I think there's so much that TEFL teachers are going to take from this, especially in terms of being creative. But, you know, to those teachers who are just dying to, you know, have that creativity in their classes, to input different ideas, you know, to, to, to make it a more collaborative process, more group work, more poetry slams, all that kind of stuff. What would you say to the teachers who are just absolutely craving that level of creativity in the classroom and they've been given license to do it, but they're just not sure how to start? What would you say to them? Oh, that's so, that's so fun. <laughs> I would say, you know, have a have a look around online. There's so much out there right now. And, and just find one thing, one thing that you want to try. Maybe you want to try a special poetry workshop tomorrow. Maybe you want to try um, playing a podcast episode and see how it goes. Maybe you want to try putting your students in book clubs for two weeks and just, you know, be a, be an observer. How How is it going? <laughs> if it's not going very well, like consider for yourself how you could improve it. Ask your students how you could improve it. Ask an online community, hey, what's worked well for you around this thing? And just think of yourself as a learner with your learners as you're, as you're rolling out your experiment. And at the end of your one day or two weeks, see if you want to do it again, you know, roll out another experiment with the next thing that you want to cover and, and see what works well for you. There, there are a lot of resources that I can offer you. I, I also have a podcast. It's called the Spark Creativity Teacher Podcast. And at this point, it's got about 200 little workshops <laughs> where wow. you could, where you could sort of check out like, oh, here's the workshop about um, Harkness discussions, or here's the workshop about um, starting a podcast with students or whatever. And you could listen to a 10 minute show or a 15 minute show, and then you could try it out um, and, and make your own call about whether you want to ever do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So I, you've, you've kind of alluded to my, my final question there, but Betsy, where, where can people find you? Because there's going to be so much that, that teacher, any, I, I honestly think any single teacher who listens to this will be able to take something from your approach. So, so where can people find you? Oh, thanks so much. So the main place would be nowsparkcreativity.com. Teachers are going to find tons of free resources there for getting started with different creative strategies. They can also check out the podcast from there or link over to my Instagram at nowsparkcreativity. Amazing. So Betsy, thank you so much for taking part in I Taught English Abroad. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. It's been really fun for me too. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to I Taught English Abroad podcast series by the TEFL Org. To keep up to date with every episode, subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your streaming platform of choice. And we love feedback, so feel free to leave us a review on any platform you like. For more information about the TEFL Org, or about teaching English as a foreign language in general, head on over to TEFL.org. That's T-E-F-L dot O-R-G. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you next time.